here today on behalf of Anthony Keown, our Director of Compliance and Enforcement, to provide an overview of the role of compliance within OLGR. Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to state that we're not about closing venues, but working with industry and our co-regulators, ensuring a safe and vibrant uh, industry. This document here is an extract of the, um, the department's uh, strategic priorities for 2015 and 2016. This document is aligned to our um, mission and vision that Rosemary covered off earlier today. The key points um, or the key concerns that relate to this or some key issues to take out of it are that we are providing an innovative uh, service uh, to support responsible and sustainable industries that we regulate. We are looking to work closely with industry and our co-regulators to achieve social and economic benefits uh, for New South Wales residents. We're committed to a risk-based mitigation and harm minimisation principles. We will apply risk-based and intelligence-led approach to effectively use finite resources available to us throughout this period. Of particular uh, note, um, point one there in the community and industry trust uh, is of significant relevance to uh, compliance. Uh, and that relates to uh, the risk of to minors, sale of minors. Obviously with the new sanctions that have come into effect that are late last year, there is an increased compliance um, reference to that, that risk, to managing uh, the risk of minors. Compliance inspectors are out in force um, monitoring and assessing um, those issues and the, and the prospective sale to minors. So we're monitoring both packaged um, outlets for the risk of sale and, and secondary supply, and likewise we'll be looking at it in, in venues. So um, one point I'd encourage all licensees to do is to make sure that you've got processes in place to manage those risks and that your, your staff are fully aware of the, the implications of the sale to minors and the impact that the, uh, those sanctions will have on your venues. Uh, in addition to that, um, the point just below, um, high risk venues and locations. Compliance uh, is now taking an intelligence based approach where we are focusing our activities towards issues of, of significant concern or emerging concerns. So we're not taking a blanket approach of looking at everything but a, a targeted approach. So we'll look at issues that, are, uh, that we've identified as, as coming to prevalence and needing to address and then we'll, we'll utilise those finite resources to, uh, to target those issues. Another one that I'll cover off of, of significance is under the compliance and vibrant industries. The first point um, related to better licensee and staff competency. That's where I would encourage licensees to ensure that you've got processes in place uh, and have um, got suitable uh, steps to ensure that you are compliant with legislation. So it's something where uh, we will obviously engage with venues uh, and provide guidance where you need, but it's an opportunity for licensees to take that first step forward of um, regulating themselves and ensuring that they have got sufficient processes in place. What I'm now looking at covering off on is our regulatory approach uh, across the board. As I said, we're taking a more uh, intelligence-led and um, uh, trying to utilise our resources as effectively as possible. As you can see by the pyramid on the left, support and engagement, that's where we're looking at using um, a maximum out, um, presence across the industry. So where we can, we'll engage with venues, uh, provide correspondence out to, uh, to the peaks and across industry to let them know uh, what issues of concern we have identified and, and how you guys can uh, look to address that. Obviously, uh, moving up from that, if uh, issues are continuing and, and we need to continue, it doesn't improve, then we're looking at stepping into it from the more compliance uh, focus. So obviously looking at conducting inspections, assessing uh, practices and, and where need, need be, implementing regulatory tools or taking enforcement action um, to, um, to prevent or to, to deter that practice from occurring. Our idea, um, obviously, with the middle one is about reducing breaches, so improving future compliance moving forward. The um, chart on the, um, the far right just gives a bit of, uh, I guess, a bit of emphasis to what we're looking at. The, the key area that we're looking at is that area in the middle between illegal and harmful. So we're not about necessarily the, the minor, more technical issues, but really getting to the root of the problem. So where that alcohol-related harm and violence is and what issues we can address or we can um, uh, act on to mitigate that and to ensure compliance within the industry and, and a safer environment for everyone. Moving forward is um, how licensees can be an active part in this process. For licensees, it's crucial that you understand your obligations so that your staff and your management are aware of what the expectations are and what the legislation requires. Uh, obviously, there are tools available um, that we've developed to support that, including checklists, 
um, and, and, and other tools were being developed, as Iona said, with the um, licensee toolkits. So they're documents that I'd encourage you to take back to um, your accord meetings and, and emphasise that to your licensees. They're um, an invaluable opportunity for you guys to get on the front foot and get out there and start making sure that you're compliant with um, with your requirements. So you go through the checklist, have a, a if not the licensee themselves and a larger venue, an appropriate manager to go through those checklists and make sure you're up to speed with what your requirements are. Obviously, uh, moving down from that, you've got to be able to comply. So again, that's about getting that education, that message across to your staff. So not having it just sit with a licensee, but having it sit with your staff as well. Again, a good tool for that is developing suitable plans of management. Now, I know that's been mentioned earlier before, and it's a bit of a, a repeating topic, but it's something that is crucial to the successful management of licensed premises. So making sure that you have processes in place and that everyone's aware of their requirements and their responsibilities and getting that message down to staff. So having sufficient training so that the staff that are involved in the sale at the, at the point are across their obligations and understand and don't drop the ball and, and cause issues for yourselves. Finally, willingness to comply. Now we acknowledge that most licensees are willing to comply and want to implement processes where they can to do so. There's only a few out there that are reluctant or will push the envelope where they can. So again, it comes back to the education and support that I covered off earlier. Now I just wanted to cover off briefly on a um, bit of a case study of one of those venues that there was a rogue, uh, rogue operator that just kept pushing the system. What I'm looking to do with this example is recognise that although most venues are willing to do the right thing and comply, there are those couple that won't. And in those instances, OLGR, with the support of the co-regulators, New South Wales uh, Police in particular, will use all tools available to us to address those issues and to ensure compliance moving forward. Welcome back, this is 10 Eyewitness News. Two men who turned a King's Cross nightclub into a cesspool of drugs and violent drunks have been banned from ever running another bar. As Lachlan Kennedy reports, it's the first time life bans have been issued in New South Wales. The busy bar at what was one of Sydney's worst nightclubs. So we're talking about multiple offences for serving liquor to minors, um, permitting intoxication, uh, right through to drug dealing on the premises. Management at Deja Vu in King's Cross was so bad between 2013 and 2014, they've now been locked out of the bar industry forever. Well, enough is enough. These blokes were beyond a joke and they're now being banned for life. From posting cartoons of illicit drug use to offering illegal drink specials, John Barakat and Dominic Kaikati thought they were above the law, even taunting authorities. On behalf of Deja Vu King's Cross, we would like to say to the King's Cross Police, LAC. According to investigators, one of the most extreme violations involved a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old who was served 10 shots, 6 beers and a multitude of spirits. The 17-year-old ended up passed out in the gutter where he was supposedly kicked by a venue promoter and told to move on, while the 15-year-old spent hours walking the streets of King's Cross before going to police for a lift home. These guys deserve nothing short of this life ban. And if anyone else is brought before our notice with this sort of behaviour, they can expect the same treatment. Licensee John Barricat has been banned from ever holding another licence, fined $11,000 and ordered to pay legal costs. Club manager Dominic Kaikati has also been banned from running any other bar and he too will pay thousands in legal fees. Rogue operators won't be tolerated and we'll use every tool at our disposal to get them out and keep them out. Neither Mr Barakat nor Mr Kai Katie responded to our messages. Lachlan Kennedy, 10 Eyewitness News. What this clip uh, clearly depicts, uh, depicts is the uh, collaborative approach between uh, New South Wales Police and OGR to address those problematic venues, those rogue traders, as Anthony described, and the fact that we will use every regulatory tool possible to us to ensure um, safe practices and a safe and uh, vibrant and responsible um, venue for, for patrons. Now I'd just like to uh, cover off briefly on a couple other issues that uh, compliance uh, looks at specifically and that relates to uh, un undesirable li liquor products, promotions and activities. Um, obviously in this slide there's a couple there that are um, ones that we've taken action for in the past. Uh, that one there relates to um, powdered alcohol. 
it's uh, something that was emerging from the United States uh, and um, had raised as a potential concern in New South Wales. OGR's um, got into the front foot with this one and taken action to uh, place that product on the undesirable liquor products list. So it's uh, official, effectively been banned from New South Wales. The one to the left, the Spiritus, uh, is one that uh, came about from a, uh, a young girl that passed away in uh, Western Australia after consuming a number of shots. Um, she's purchased it from a bottle shop, taken her home at an 18th path party, and, um, and that's where that occurred. So uh, in response to that, um, OGR engaged with a number of operators and packaged outlets that were involved in the sale of that and negotiated uh, sufficient safeguards to ensure that that product wasn't, was at a reduced risk to minors. Uh, the little fat lamb was one that we engaged with the operator or the producers and the concern there related to the risk to miners being marketed uh, actively towards miners. So again, it was involved uh, with engagement with the uh, manufacturers to ensure that the product was uh, sufficiently branded not to pose that threat. The bottom two down there just relate to our, um, oops, or re they related to our, our concerns regarding liquor promotions or activities. The, uh, the one with the gummy bears, um, they were vodka soaked, so it was, uh, obviously raises significant concerns to us and, and enough for us to take action on. So in those cases um, where we identify promotions or activities of concern, we will um, seek to take action. We will um, issue show cause notices where appropriate and uh, seek for uh, submissions from the licensee before making decisions. Um, it's important also to recognise that OGR, our compliance section, will also monitor uh, online and um, social media. So we will have a look at what promotions venues are conducting and how they market themselves. Finally, I just wanted to uh, cover off briefly on this, and this relates to, um, I guess, our accountability and transparency. Um, recently, we've made uh, change practices, so as of the 1st of March, to uh, place a number of decision documents on our website for public viewing. In particular, they relate to uh, Section 81 decisions concerning um, disturbance complaints and also uh, decisions relating to second strikes. Thank you.